a great pleasure to introduce Haggai Peretz. Haggai did his PhD at the Weizmann Institute and then moved to the CFA where he held more fellowships than I care to name, many of them simultaneously. Um, so that's a, that's a real achievement. And he's now at Technion University in Israel and is currently the Kingsley Visiting, Kingsley Visiting Professor at Caltech. So we figured while he was in the neighborhood, we'd get him here to visit. Um, Haggai has worked on a wide range of topics related to dynamics from black holes to stars, globular clusters, blue stragglers, planetary dynamics, planet formation. And I think today he's going to focus on solar system topics. Um, but, planet if formation, yeah. but if there's uh, anything you'd like to ask him about any topic in astrophysics, I encourage you to try him out just for fun. Um, he's probably already started collaborations with most of you in his meetings today, so I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more from him after his talk. So, take it away. Yeah. Hello, thanks, Katie. And of course, I met Katie at the CFA. We work together there. Um, so, before I begin, I do work a lot on. Have, I actually consider which topic would I present here, and I will think about type 1 supernovae. So, they have uh, interesting, very interesting models, new models for the origin of type 1 supernovae. But then I thought that. A bit more planetary people here, so I decided to go to that direction. But they're also working on so type one supernova, N1, gravitational waves. I'll be happy to talk about various interesting results. And, and some of the results here are actually related to the stuff they're working about gravitational wave sources. But what I want to tell you about today is various issues regarding to planet formation and solar system objects. And I try to kind of bring up some new, interesting, maybe crazy ideas and some out-of-the-box ideas, some of them are actually, actually literally out-of-the-box ideas, uh, how to potentially solve or, uh, this uh, study some of the diff most difficult problems we have in planet formation. So you all, uh, I guess, familiar with uh, the various stages that we understand today of planet formation. I'm talking only about the core equation uh, scenario in this case. So we start with, uh, several, with protoplanetary disk. We have out of planetesimal settling down. You have some uh, uh, with encounter gas drag. When they have collisions of uh, small planetesimals, I mean up to a millimeter, centimeter size, and a bit above, they can actually fragment. It's very difficult to grow them to larger, larger uh, size planetesimals. And you have the so-called intersize barrier related to interaction with the gas, which I'll discuss a bit more in, in a second. So we have very main difficulties in understanding planet formation at the stage of coming from a meter size, more or less, Planetesimals up to kilometer size planetesimals, where you can actually then go on uh, with less trouble, let's say, uh, at least until you get to embryo planet, kind of protoplanet uh, size, where you have another potential problem of how to get there fast enough in order to be able to accrete uh, enough gas to get gas giants, for example. So I would say the main two big problems are kind of the small, meter size regime and the larger scale regime. And various uh, uh, models suggested uh, came uh, to try to explore this. Uh, I think most notably is, of course, the seeming stability that Andrew suggested uh, regarding the small planetesimals, and you can actually form them. And I'll discuss some of these issues. So later on, you, have, you, know, you can have this collision of growth, gravitational instability, maybe helped by streaming instability. Um, and later on, you have the, now these bigger planetesimals, and they dynamically evolve. They accrete material, small planetesimals, and they uh, uh, start at some point to collide with each other. If you form a gas a planetary embryos, they can start accreting gas if you still have gas in the disk. And you can get this gas giant formation. And a lot of the terrestrial planet growth actually happens on longer time scale. You have these kind of smaller embryos, but on longer time scale of maybe 100 mega years, these later on dynamically collide and grow through very giant impact collision kind of thing. And I will discuss several of these uh, points and kind of try to pinpoint some interesting issues at every, or not every, but several points uh, on this way. One of them will be related to, uh, most of them related to interaction with gas. So it will be ablation, planetesimal seeding, and pebble accretion, I'll discuss later on. And the other is actually related to uh, kind of, if I'll get to it, I'm not sure actually I get all the topics that um, I plan to uh, discuss multiple giant impacts and the possibility that Earth's moon is actually not the only moon that Earth had, but actually had many previous moons. And if hopefully I'll get it to the end. So let's start to go, go through. So. This shows the collision parameter between you know, two particles of different diameters, and what is the outcome? So we have mass gain if they collide and actually gain mass, or if they actually collide and fragment, they actually have mass loss. Okay? And what you can see is exactly what I said, that around kind of uh, meter size, 
uh, or so, you can, oh, up, the, up to that point, you might actually be able to grow through collisions, but later on, it starts to become more difficult to grow stuff to larger size. So that's one part of the so-called meter barrier problem. Um, the other part, even more well-known, is the one that goes back like uh, 40, 50 years uh, to, uh, uh, you know, mostly weight machining in the, in the 70s, but also there are some <coughs> Japanese groups, uh, groups like Adaki. And the idea there is that if you have a protoplanetary disk, which is gas, okay, you have some gas you know, pressure gradients in the disk, and because of that, you effectively have some force, a additional force on the gas, so the gas doesn't really move completely uh, in a Kaparian orbit around the, around the star. It moves a bit slower. Now, if you look on some kind of solid object, let's say a planet, just move in a Kaparian orbit, it doesn't care about any of this gas pressure or whatever, just continues on, so you have a kind of headwind on the planet. But the planet doesn't actually care too much about this headwind. Well, that's not exactly true, but we'll discuss it later on. If you go to very, very small particles, you know, uh, then they are completely coupled to the gas. It's like, the, I don't know, whatever small particles that you see sometimes in the light just going with the, uh, with the, with the gas. So they are completely cap coupled to the gas. They're just flowing on with the gas. But of course, if you have these two regimes, you must have a regime where it's neither of them. So you have, and it's kind of peaks around the meter side, depending on the separation from the sun, where these planetesimals see a headwind, okay? It goes faster than the gas around it. On the other hand, this, and, and this gas kind of headwind actually affects it and produces significant gas drag that uh, dissipates its orbital energy. It can inspire into the sun <coughs> potentially in even a few hundred years which is, of course, a problem if you want to grow planets and you don't want them to be killed all this early stage of a few hundred years. So the question is, how can you actually get them faster into larger uh, sizes so they would be less affected by uh, this uh, uh, gas drag? And as I said, this is kind of typically peaks at a meter size. Uh, uh, okay, actually, I just mentioned it. So before I'm going to try and provide an interesting solution for that, let's make it even worse. Okay, so people discuss this fragmentation and this discuss erosion by particles actually uh, cutting off these uh, uh, things. But actually, if you look even on the wind itself, if you think about, for example, meteorites coming through the atmosphere, right? They kind of burn in atmosphere. And people discuss also planetesimals going into the atmosphere's gas giants. As they go through in the atmosphere, they actually being, become ablated. There are various kinds of ablation, but they actually ablated and slowly being uh, eroded through this uh, headwind. Actually, if you think about the, the protoplanetary disk, protoplanetary disk, the velocities between the kind of particles and the gas are much slower. It's not like a meteorite coming out to, to coming down to the Earth. Uh, on the other hand, they actually spend a very long time there. They could be spending uh, no, millions of years there. So even slow ablation could be uh, very important. And if you actually do put the numbers in, you can find that, that even 10 meter size planetesimals can actually erode, okay, all, to, all, to the, all, all the way to about 10 centimeter size Planetesimals because of ablation. So actually, it's, it's a very difficult time for uh, planetesimals to grow, even uh, if you didn't, did, no, didn't think about all these other issues. For example, this gas drag, maybe you have so-called uh, no, migration traps, uh, places where the pressure gradient changes, and you actually can kind of collect some planetesimal in the same region. But even there, you'll have turbulence, so ablation would still, for example, uh, make, problem, make problems for, the, uh, for planetesimals to become uh, bigger. This is one, right? Yes, of course. We also, I didn't, show, I don't show that, but we also included uh, radial drift. And then you actually need to think, of course, the closed ones, if you just look, look radial drift, the small ones will just go to the sun, as usual. The ones that are further out could start migrating. If they would start, just put them there, they would not ablate because the density of the gas is small. But because of the gas drift, they're actually coming through, and then ablate, ablation becomes more important. So actually, radial drift, in that sense, kills even more because it kills stuff that's coming even from the outside. So we did also, we did include, try to include also this. As I said, it's actually too fast. So close in, it just kill. Uh, yeah. Why is it so fast around meter? It's actually for the same reason. Okay. Like it's not like it's not it's actually for the same reason in some sense that, that the meter size barrier exists. Because it's the regime where you have the kind of the biggest differences in sense of uh, relative velocities. And, uh, and also, if you're, too, if you're really big, then you don't care. You ablate a bit, but you cannot really ablate all the way through. So it's kind of in more or less on the same, uh, the same scale. So, okay, so I made it even worse. So that's not very helpful. So when I was actually in the CFA, and, and at some point we had this, uh, I call, we call it uh, crazy, it was the crazy coffee. 
it's creative research something ideas and and I thought about this all this effect of gas if his gas drag is so bad let's try to fight gas drag with gas drag can you actually solve the problem the gas drag provides with gas drag and honestly we suggested I thought of this the following if you if you have let's say you have some particles and testimonies and you have another one coming through close by if there was no gas, would accelerate, then comes back and continue. Nothing happens, of course, unless it directly physically collides. Fine. But if you could actually dissipate the energy, you can actually capture this planetesimal around this uh, uh, companion. This was actually suggested as a way to form a binary Kuiper belt object at some point. People suggested you have these two massive Kuiper belt objects just coming close to each other. You have a lot of small planetesimals, not gas, just small planetesimals. You have some dynamical friction because these are massive compared to the planetesimals. So because of the micro friction, as you go through, you also dissipate energy. You can be captured and then slowly migrate in and actually become a closer in binary. So I thought, okay, we have tons more of gas than just small solids and planetesimals. What can you do with the gas? And for small things, gas drag is pretty efficient. So if I have a small thing coming through, dissipating energy as it's kind of inside the potential or close potential of the another object, it can be captured. And once it's captured, now when it, it's continued to migrate because of gas drag, but now it actually migrates onto this part, this planetesimal, so you can actually accrete uh, on top of this planetesimal stuff. And this is actually what, no, what, what uh, we did is in these models, and we had this first paper coming out, and the second paper was supposed to show this whole evolution. In the first paper, we were just start, suggested this is the idea. And, and then for various reasons, this was postponed for a long time, but, uh, and just published this year, this is Rosemary Clay and a student. But I think uh, you probably all know it now because this is, today it's called the uh, pebble accretion, okay? Uh, I think, and Chris Ormel actually worked on that at the same time that we did, at, some, at the point. Uh, and later on, people actually looked at it uh, a bit more. So effectively, you have so small stuff coming through, dissipating, being captured, then accreted onto, to, uh, onto these planetesimals. So what's, why is that so important? Because you can actually increase the impact parameter where things can be actually captured. It's not just a physical, for example, collision or the gravitational focus collision. You can actually really get things which are further out to be collected by these uh, uh, embryos. And as it turns out, this actually doesn't work for small things like meteor size, but it does work if you look on embryos that accrete small, more, very small things. Originally, I thought about it, we thought maybe we can work even for a small regime. It doesn't work there, but it does work for big things, accreting small things. And that actually you know, potentially helps with solving the second problem of actually producing embryos that grow very fast at a later stage. But it doesn't help you with the meter size barrier at this point. Okay, so this was kind of a pebble accretion. So when you look at planet formation, people, these, all these models, you see that at late times of the evolution, once planets form, they start actually ejecting a lot of the material. Things become less efficient. You throw a lot of material. Where do you throw it? You actually eject it into the ISN. So you have tons of small planetesimals, very sized, that can be ejected if you form a whole planetary system. And I was thinking, that's an interesting kind of resource of planetesimals. What can you do with that? Um, and it turns out that you know, if you throw it out, in principle, you can capture it again by other solar systems, in principle. <coughs> and people discuss you know, uh, capture of interstellar material, for example, in astro astrobiology, can you actually transfer material from one solar system to another? And most of these ideas were not very efficient. We were kind of, you need some dissipation. Again, it's a very similar idea that you need some dissipation to capture it into an orbit, right? So the question is, how can you dissipate it? So if you have multiple bodies that can help you exchange energy, but I'm going again back to gas to the, gas to the rescue. So let's say you have a protoplanetary disk. Now we have a planetesimal coming through this protoplanetary disk, it can dissipate energy in the same way that we discussed and actually being captured into this protoplanetary disk. So of course we can calculate what's the fraction or how many particles can be captured by the solar system. You can calculate the velocity dispersion between, planetes no, between stars or planetesimal ejected into the ISM, uh, calculate how many of them should be you know, going through an impact parameter with the size of the protoplanetary disk. And as a result, of course, until we get some uh, uh, recent visitors, we didn't really know the rates, okay? But there were some estimates. And we used that, these estimates to actually get the numbers. As it turns out, they were quite big numbers. Then the question, of course, whether they can be really captured into the disk or not. And as I said, now that we know, we saw Umamua, more recently we have this comet Borisov that seems to be interstellar visitors uh, coming through. Uh, maybe they have some life. Well, 
people suggest. <laughs> um, so if you look on the orbit of that, for example, okay, uh, so this is one more coming through the solar system, right, and coming out. There's no dissipation, so effectively it doesn't really change. Actually, people did measure a bit of uh, some evolution, maybe from outgassing, but it's not really uh, a lot. So we cannot really capture it in this way. But let's say this is the situation. Much earlier on, not today, so we have the same umamua coming through, but now we have this photopionary disk with a lot of gas. You can, again, it can dissipate the energy, the kinetic energy, and be captured into an orbit. So you can do the basic calculation. You say, okay, we know what is the gas drag force. That's very simple. It's exactly the same idea that you use for calculating the meter size barrier. And you know the velocity and the crossing time for an object through the disk. It's pretty thin. It depends, of course, on the angle. And you need to look on various different angles. And uh, then you can calculate how much energy is dissipated. Basically, if the energy that you dissipate is larger than its kinetic energy, you can capture, actually capture it at the separation that it is. You can actually capture it into the protopine disk. Actually, once it's inside the protopine disk, even if it's high inclination, it now goes over and over in the protopine disk and continues to dissipate until it actually pretty fast goes into the disk in any case. Um, so you can actually calculate what the fraction, what happened, you know, as you can now see, instead of going in and out, now you're actually going, doing this and going into the disk kind of uh, thing. So in principle, you can actually capture planetesimals into the disk. The interesting thing is, I thought of, can you actually capture big planetesimals, like kilometer size? If I capture kilometer size planetesimal, I jump over, bringing out of the box, really literally, objects coming into the disk and serving as kind of seeds for planet formation. Are they enough? So actually people said, people actually calculated how many kilometer size planetesimals do you need in order to form a whole planetary system? Turns out that just a few of them is actually enough. Each one of them actually really serves as a seed, starts accreting material, you know, accelerate, the, the growth accelerates, and actually can form a whole planet even if you started with kilometer size stuff. So in principle, all you need is just a few kilometer size uh, planetesimals in the disk to start this whole planet formation uh, uh, mechanism. So if you now do kind of a Monte Carlo calculation, trying to do all the different angles, try to uh, typical uh, rates, and also look on two different environments. We can think of a field environment, a cluster environment. Field environment is like the sun. It's just roaming around the galaxy. The velocity dispersion between stars like 40 kilometers per second. So things are going pretty fast uh, near each other. If you think about the early days of solar systems, maybe many of them were formed in small cluster association. Then you have quite a few stars coming together the relative velocity dispersion before this whole cluster disperses is much smaller. It could be like a few kilometers per second. So it could be easier to capture any planetesimal out there. And also, planetesimals, if they're not ejected too high velocity, can be captured into this cluster environment. And so you might actually have higher density of these uh, planetesimals. So anyway, we looked at both of these environments. And as it turns out, a, a, a non-negligible non fraction of these old planetesimals can be captured. What we see here. Is, this is the size of the decimal in meters, and this is the probability for it being captured, in, in essence. These are n-body simulations, and these are coming from our analytic calculation in two regimes, uh, which where they cross each other and form this kind of uh, you know, bimodal kind of uh, linear things. So how many can you capture? Of course, it depends on how much mass do you have in the in planetesimal in the, in, the, in, the, in the ISM, which we don't really know, especially we prefer one more. So of course, we models suggest that you can actually eject up to about an Earth's mass of material out there. And now, of course, the question is how many of them are in each size. That depends, and people suggested various different uh, power law distribution for the size of uh, interstellar uh, of uh, planetesimals that are formed. So we look on, on these different uh, power laws, but in general, what we find is that you can actually get kilometer size uh, planetesimals captured even in the field where the relative velocities are very high. You can capture at least, an, at least an order of one per planetary system, okay? And uh, 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 in the cluster environment, as it turns out, you can actually get uh, less because many of the planetesimals are ejected too high velocity and are not captured in the cluster. But this was actually, so it, it depends on, on, on which uh, uh, environment, it, sorry, this is higher, not so on. Um, so here you can even get you know, up to even almost a few kilometer size and still capturing planetesimals. This was before Umamua. If you actually take the estimates, the inferred estimates of the number of ice and planetesimals from Oumuamua, it's a Poissonian, we had one, now we have maybe two. Actually, the, the numbers go are 50 times higher than what we actually originally uh, have, had, have had, which is, was conservative estimate, as it turns out. And then you can get much, much higher. So these are the kind of uh, faint shaders, the regions. 
And then even in the, in, even in the field, you can get kind of the order of a few tens of kilometer size. And 100 meter size spiritesimals like Umamua, you can get the tens of thousands even. So every planetary system today should actually be able to capture many of these big things, and they could actually serve as seeds. So it's kind of a strange solution to this problem. And you might say, uh, well, is, uh, so, uh, right, so, so this is what I said, uh, that a small number of them could be actually enough to do seed plant formation. But then you might say the following, wait, this cannot really solve anything, right? Because, hey, I brought a kilometer size planetesimal, but yeah, it's the turtle stuff, right? They're standing on other turtles. How did you actually get this uh, kilometer size planetesimal to begin with? So this, this model cannot actually solve the meter cells barrier by itself, but it can make it exponentially easier to solve. Why is that? Let's say some of the ideas, and very likely, some of the ideas suggesting a formation of kilometer size planetesimals do work. For example, you know, streaming stability or other suggestions, they seem to they have challenges, but you know, sometimes, sometimes, and sometimes they could be fine-tuned. But there are conditions under which it seems like they should work quite robustly. Even if these are rare conditions, and that's not necessarily the case, but even if they were rare conditions, it's enough that a small number of systems could work out, form a whole planetary system. You form a whole planetary system, now you're starting ejecting, ejecting planetesimals. Each time you capture a few planetesimals in another solar system early enough, that one form another, no, form planetary system and eject much more planetesimals. So as you, get, you can imagine, the early start is slow, but once you start actually having more and more Planet, planetary system eject planetesimals, they seed more of them and you ex exponentially grow in terms of the number of systems that you can seed. Currently, with the current numbers of planetary systems that we know of, assuming that each one of them ejected some material, today every system should actually capture many of them. But even what I'm saying is that even at the early stages, well, it was kind of the first rare case of a successful kilometer size uh, planetesimal form, that was enough to initiate this whole evolution. It's enough that, for example, a cluster of 100 systems, it's enough that even one of them would be, you know, easily can, can, one of them could capture. Then it's a jet material. This goes on and on, and you can finish. Indeed. So it may potentially have fine-tuned conditions become quite fine. We actually make all the fine-tuned models for uh, going over the meter size barrier not to be fine-tuned. You don't need them to work so, much, so well. Just want to work sometimes. Okay? That's enough, and that's the idea that we get with planetary system seeding. So yeah, you cannot really, it doesn't solve by itself, but it really makes most of the planet formation uh, initiation uh, everywhere. It's just the first one early on that should move forward. Okay, so in a sense, what you say is that gas problem is not the problem, it's actually the solution in that sense. You said that you could have planetary seeding, and you said earlier that you actually also solve the second problem using pebble accretion, which also use gas drive in that sense. So now I'm going to change gears completely, still working on small planetesimals, but now going on into our own, own solar system and talking about an interesting uh, system, uh, Ultima II, uh, which I, each time I forget the telephone number, so I just call it Ultima. Okay? So New Horizons, after going to Pluto and Charon, having the first images of uh, uh, Pluto and Charon, direct images, they went to another object in the Kuiper Belt, and surprisingly enough, or not, people actually saw this kind of interesting contact binary, okay? And uh, they had kind of a s not a very well image as it goes through from the shadows, and originally this was thought to be kind of like a snowman, right? You probably heard about it. Two balls kind of on top of each other, you can think of a snowman. But as it turns out, you have a side view, and it turns out there are actually quite kind of two edge ones sitting on top of each other, a bit of, kind of almost on the edge, more. So, what else do we know about that? We know that it rotates pretty slow. What do I mean by pretty slow? Much slower than what you expect from a two, star, no, two things which are just bound to each other through gravitational energy, right? So you have Kepler and Orbic, and then they come in contact, so it be kind of comparable to the escape velocity, the kind of the rotation. Here, the rotation is much, much slower, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing, these are pretty soft things. It's in order to actually kind of connect them and not getting them completely destroyed, you need a very, very slow velocity of impact. Otherwise, it would just crash down. And we actually have simulation showing that it's a, it can easily uh, be crashed down. So you need low velocity, and you also need this uh, low, uh, low, low rotation velocity and low impact velocity. What else? 
We also know it's pretty highly inclined compared to the orbit. So it has the orbit around the sun, but we also know it's kind of almost 90 degrees to this orbit. Okay, going like that. Somewhat like kind of Uranus in, in that sense, in the sense of the direction. So the question is now, how did you actually form this thing? Okay. So um, I'll begin with some possible models. Let's say you have some, you form some kind of a binary and then it slowly migrates, for example, because of tidal evolution between two planets and around, or gas drag. We actually said, I suggested already a few years ago that gas drag can also help you migrate things together, can actually ma make them merge. But any kind of these models that, that brings you slowly to each other, that is fine. It means, first of all, the impact velocity is small. Fine, we can actually get it. But it also means, as I just told you, that they should have actually very fast rotational velocity. Okay? So that is actually a problem for any of these kind of models that slowly puts this uh, thing together. So what else? Well, a few years back, and I was actually very excited when I see, saw Ultima, I suggested this idea that, uh, and actually I asked you a question first. Do you, does anyone know how many binary Kuiper belt objects do you have in the solar system? Well, the ratio is close to 50 percent. So wrong. None of them. All the binary Kuiper belt objects in the solar system have the sun as a third object. They are all triples. Okay. <laughs> so that is actually very important. Okay, I'm not just measuring it. So yes, there are actually a very large fraction of binary KBOs, could be 50%, so many of them are uh, uh, binaries. With the sun, they are uh, triples. As some of you know, I really like triples and work on them, and so a few years back in my PhD, I thought about all of these binaries around the compact, uh, around the massive object in the center. So this could be binary stars near a massive black hole, this could be binary asteroid or Kuiper belt object around the sun. All of them are triple systems. And triple systems have all of these secular evolution, uh, so-called lead of quasi evolution, in which, because of the preparation of the third object, if the relative inclination between the two systems is typically high, about typically about 40 degrees, this inner binary secularly evolves and changes its inclination and its eccentricity. So as it goes, let's say you start with the 90 degrees, it evolves into 40 degrees, become highly eccentric, so the pericenter is very small. And then it goes back, become 90 degrees, and larger, and larger pericenter. And it goes on, it's kind of a, a oscillation of this, more or less periodic oscillation. So this is the basic of lead of quasi kind of evolution. So what I suggested already in 2009 with uh, my collaborators, Madonna Oz, now in UCLA, we suggested the following. You have these binaries. Some of them are highly inclined. If they're highly inclined, they're going to go through this quasi oscillation. And at pericenter, if they're actually close enough, or they also could be involved in, with the tidal evolution, they actually might evolve and come into potentially contact, or at least certainly evolve much and being destroyed as a binary and become a single object, for example. Either that, or tidally evolved to become, instead of being a wide orbit, kind of tidally evolved into short period orbit. So we suggest that you might actually even find these relatively highly inclined contact binaries in the Kuiper belt because of this mechanism. The thing is that I told you that in 90 degrees, you have kind of the large, large space center, and then you go to 40 degrees to get a smaller space center. So if they're going to collide, it's most likely to actually form either in 40 degrees or the other way around, 140 degrees, and not so much actually 90 degrees, okay? It actually should be depleted in the region of 90 degrees. We actually even see it in the solar system. I forgot to show the, the, to bring this picture. If you look on irregular satellites of gas giant in the solar system, and you look on the inclination, what you see is that you have many retrograde orbits, you have many prograde orbits, but actually you have this whole empty region at high inclination in respect to the orbit. And people suggest that Kozai evolution, for example, killed all of these moons that were in this intermediate uh, regime. So this is more or less kind of, we suggest a very similar mechanism for binary KBOs and binary asteroids. Um, but as I said, we found it at about 90 degrees. So Ultima actually has a, has a hard time to actually go through that through Kozai because it's, not, it's in the wrong inclination. Of course, maybe other perturbation kind of affected it, so certainly it's possible. So that's one solution. But we thought, I thought about an interesting mechanism that I realized a few years uh, back, also when I was started working in, in Harvard, I think in Technion. And what we found out is that this secular lead of quasi evolution, okay, they start to change once you get to a very large uh, separation. Once the period of this inner binary, okay, has a time scale of the period, the dynamic capacity becomes comparable to the so-called secular time scale. At this point, this is not completely secular evolution. Actually, you need to account for all of this perturbation 
and people mostly analyze it using kind of analytic solution, but in this case, you actually need an extra uh, effect. It's not easy to solve it analytically. And it turns out they actually have very different evolution. What kind of evolution? You see this kind of similar evolution. What is your, this is the time. This is uh, uh, kind of the one minus eccentricity, I think, here. Yeah? Okay. So you see it's kind of this oscillation. This is what we all usually see in quasi cycle. The eccentricity becomes very high, then low, high, low. Okay, that is fine. But what you see here, and this is not just a matter of resolution, is that Perry Center actually goes a different, each time it goes, each cycle actually goes a di di different stage, different uh, Perry Center. It's not like kind of completely periodic. It actually shows this strange, quite chaotic evolution. As it turns out, if you are in this kind of intermediate regime of very wide separation, this secular evolution is becomes quasi-secular, and you can actually jump in pericenter. You don't really slowly evolve to higher pericenter, but you actually jump over these different regimes. And you can actually get, as it turns out, you can actually get even into collisions, even at high, very high inclination, even close to 90 degrees. So you're not limited anymore to this uh, uh, region of preferably 14, uh, 140 degrees. This is an example of this kind of evolution. Originally, we actually find that out for binaries near a massive black hole. The same idea just scaled up. And there it was actually very interesting because if you can merge binaries, let's say you have two compact objects, and you merge them, you have a gravitational wave source. So you have an interesting way of actually accelerating the formation of gravitational wave sources near massive black hole, something which Christopher here also works with, uh, I think, and uh, many, many interesting follow-ups. just told me about really interesting stuff he's doing about that. Uh, but so it's the same idea can actually work here, okay? In the solar system, the scale down that. And if you actually look on the, you know, this is kind of initial inclination versus the initial inclination of the binary versus the final inclination when it merges after the circular evolution, as you can see, it's all over the place. So you still need initial inclination to be high. If, you, if they are too low, you can't do it. Circular evolution doesn't do much. But the final inclination, now you can have kind of this all this uniform distribution of inclination all throughout this high inclination region. You don't need all these 1,440 degrees here. So you can actually get this ultima in principle to collide as a tie button. Because it can actually do any impact parameter, you can also, you don't need it to collide at very, you know, at when a, a, a kind of, at, if it was collided completely, kind of really on the edge on, you would have this high rotation velocity. But if it's at zero impact parameter, there's no rotational velocity, right? If there's just zero angular momentum, you just collide and don't have any rotation. So in principle, you can get whatever rotation you want. And spe specifically, if you take like 35 degree impact parameters, it turns out we can actually get the rotation that we've seen for uh, Tultima. So the rotations are fine, okay? The inclination is fine. We have a robust mechanism of making wide binaries into this. And since it was a wide binary, these are not two objects which are kind of uh, unbound to each other and collided at very high velocity. They were complete, to, to begin with, they were bound. So the veloc relative velocity, even at collision, were relatively slow. And as it turns out, you can actually form them and they don't crash and, and do anything interesting. Um, actually, we look back on the COSI stuff. It turns out that, uh, you know, if, if these uh, planetesimals have some kind of non spherical structure, they have the shape issues, so-called J2 effects, that also affect the secular evolution. They, can, for example, can quench you know, the COSI evolution, actually can quench this. Also, there's some region, this is separation, so, so sorry, in the units of field radii, and this is the inclination, the cosinus cos inclination. So once you get to about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of the heat radius, you get to this quasi-secular, non-secular regime, and you get these ultimas. As it turns out, even COSI can do it in some limited phase space, not at high inclinations, but it can still do these contact binaries at a, low, a bit lower inclination. Okay, so a bit of can movies. I, can, can you, I'm just a little confused about the, so why is the J2 term not important in the wider distribution, I mean, for the, so the non-secular regime? So what, is, what happens, you know, if you think about J2 is kind of the shape. So if you look for very far away, the effect of the you know, non-sphericity relative, relative to the overall potential becomes small. So the effects become a bit uh, They have to be almost colliding for them to, they have to be close to almost collide. Right, so. exactly. So at this point, so you need, in order to, to do that, they need to really go, not coming, coming from not being too close and to be so exactly know. state on. So okay. the quasi secular evolution, you can do these jumps. In the COSI case, if, you, on the extreme, you can get it relatively fast. Okay, it's almost close to the quasi secular region. This is why you can actually get it in this kind of larger separation, even the cosine. But yes, in the inner part, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, so, okay, I don't know if you saw this. So, we also did impact, and this is rock and roll. So, these are the rocks, and they roll on each other. As you can see, actually, it hits it here, but then, right, you see, it hits it, but then it starts to roll over a bit, right? 
and goes on. And but it's in the end, as you can see, you can get this neck thing and you know, this edge on, and they don't crush or anything. They actually form this kind of thing. They actually try to look on different angles. It's interesting. So it's kind of like, I don't know, there's two stones coming out together. It's, these are always fun to do, uh, you know, to, show, to see something you can actually you see. So in principle, you can actually produce this in, in, with reasonable uh, no, material strength, of course. We looked on different material strengths. So things potentially work out and can actually can explain, potentially explain uh, the origin of Ultima, which I think uh, is pretty nice. Uh, so it's why binaries actually produce these very short period binaries. Uh, that is interesting. By the way, if you look on the distribution of inclination, I think something which uh, Andrew was involved in, and uh, it's your student, right? Hi. So, uh, so we looked at that in like 2010, where there was much, much less uh, uh, data. At the time, it was like a kind of more or less, I could be comp consistent with uh, isotropic. Though, so there are many, many uh, wi very uh, wi large inclination. So that could actually work out for these both quasi and the secular. Uh, what I think that you found is now they have you no, know, they have some preference, but to prograde uh, orbits, if I understand correctly, right? Uh, this is still fine, especially for the very wide uh, orbits. Uh, this could work out as long as they are high enough. Okay, you don't care if it's prograde or retrograde uh, in that uh, in that sense. Okay, I have a couple questions about yeah. this. Um, one is you said for reasonable material strength. So there are some, I mean, obviously experimental constraints on that, and then some constraints you can get from like dust, dust in the disk. Well, so did you do a comparison of what you would need for the velocities that, that you're yeah, so for this? Yeah, so actually, the, no, which, um, so I had, no, okay, I, I don't have, I have a movie. I have another movie actually show much, uh, you know, weaker strengths. And then what's going on, it, it goes inside the other, it kind of splashes, and really con the contact, the kind of this uh, uh, neck here is much, much, much bigger, which okay. is not consistent. So certainly we can, but the thing is also we need to remember that there are, there are some degeneracies because the impact parameter, for example, affects it. So if you look at different impact parameters, the spin changes, but if then they also change the structure, you can get go back to the rotational velocity. Which is different. So, so there are some degeneracies with the strengths, mm -hmm. but for, reason, for a range of reasonable parameters, you can actually get it. It's, so it's not like a fine-tuned, very fine-tuned condition. But it's true that you know, if, you, if they are very weak, even at this low velocity, they would crash into each other and kind of make this kind of much smaller, uh, smaller neck. Okay. This is certainly true. So my other question is, um, it, one of them obviously has a very high aspect ratio. It's like a frisbee rather than yep. a piece of rock. Um, do you find any alignment? Uh, so if we had a lot of these frisbee-like disks with the orbital plane, like, is there a particular reason why one would come at this direction and the other at okay. this direction? So that is a very inter interesting question. That of course, we expected the referee to ask, and he did, or she did. Um, and that's a difficult part. I, I don't, first, basic answer is I don't know, okay? okay. But now I'll try to hand wave stuff. Um, so, uh, what we did, these simulations are for edge on thing, uh, no different impact, ang impact, but basically edge on. Then I, I suggested that, that, okay, this could be, of course, by luck in some sense, okay, but that's not interesting. What we did is start first, so we did one simulation. This is actually stuff that we are really working on right now. So, I can tell you what we have really hot from the oven is when we do this kind of night, almost 90 degrees, still edge on, on, the, on this edge, okay, what happens is they do like this. And they're like this. So they're on top of each other, also edge on, but on the wrong direction. Okay? So they kind of sit on each other. It's actually interesting enough because one of the comments that people saw, what's its name? It's a long name, I don't remember, actually looked like these two, two stones sitting on top of each other like this. Okay? So that was interesting. The other thing I want to see now is if you have not 90 degrees but larger, because now what you have is your angle, you know, angular momentum can either take you this, but it can also make you the other way around, actually pulls you out from this. And if this is the case, then we have a relatively robust because, it's, okay, you have some range of, of inclination you can do like this. No, that's actually, it goes like this, continue to, and because final momentum, change it, it even slow it down, the rotation. So you can even get higher uh, initial rotation and then it goes up. Does that work? I don't know because this is exactly what I hope for to see the result in next week from these kind of simulations. Okay. Yeah. So my apologies because I think I had missed probably a very basic are you creating this with the slow rotation period in it, despite a high density, or are you going to spin it down and 
later? Um, so we started, each one of them has no spin right now, okay? But no, if they just came in contact slowly, they would have almost escape velocity. So they would be very, very fast spinning. Okay, if they just came in contact, no, slowly migrating in somehow and then touching each other, then it would be comparable to the Keplerian velocity, basically. So this would be very fast. So the argument we've always made that these have to have a very low density, you know, that maybe it would go on. Yeah, so one possibility, of course, if as they charge each other, and I think uh, one of the, I, I think I, I talked with Derek Richardson about that, they can actually make s under some specific, you know, he said it also, I think, pretty fine-tuned conditions where you can, using the material strength, they actually evolve in a way that they can actually do it in relatively, uh, with, uh, with getting the rotation. This is kind of a bit more fine-tuning. In our case, it's, you don't need any fine-tuning. It's the impact parameter can actually give you any velocity or spin velocity that you want. So in that sense, we are fine. Even if you start with some spins of those things, you can again get uh, almost anything that, uh, that you want. And so it's easy to actually get much lower angular momentum in this case because these are kind of highly eccentric interact, highly interactive, eccentric collision. These are not circular like a collision. Sure, but if you have something very highly eccentric, you have to get rid of all of that. You know, you still have to get rid of energy at the time. Yeah, but, but this, is, this is why we did this. This is taking into account the velocities coming from the uh, uh, wide binary in contact, and you can see it's fine. They don't crush each other. This is why we actually tested this. Because the velocities, as I said, these were bound binaries. You cannot get the velocities higher than the escape velocity, okay, by definition. So this is, this is why, how we get this low velocity in this case, which is also the same case for any other model that get this low velocity, so just start with some kind of a binary. Okay? I will have to read your paper. This okay. Requires a lot. Hopefully you pulled it out at least next week or so. Um, Okay, just last mention about this. I would even suggest that Pluto Sharon form in the same way. So Pluto Sharon, we know that it has no, it's kind of a, a very uh, tidally locked, uh, no, it's a binary planet. And it has also a few small planetesimals orbiting that one. Uh, I think both Caitlin and Andrew work on these uh, issues. And, but, and people suggested that you can actually get it from, uh, in principle you can get it from a collision. You have two, this massive Pluto and Sharon, Pluto, Pluto and Sharon, they collide, and it turns out if you have a gray zone collision, you can actually capture this companion into an orbit, and then it tidally evolves. It's also material that potentially may form these small uh, other moons. Okay, so that was the basic idea. One of the things that is actually need very low velocity. Okay, uh, so it was so in order for this impact to actually for produce this, and it's two of the biggest planetesimals in the solar system, and you have by random those two actually capturing, you know, colliding with each other. And so what I suggest is actually, maybe they actually started as a very wide binary. The same kind of idea would, again, make them collide at relatively low velocity, basically escape velocity. And again, you can actually get the same kind of thing. By the way, they have high inclination. They have, I think, 120 degree inclination. So this uh, should also be in, in this kind of regime. So these are not true, but this is an interesting idea and follow-up that pluto Sharon itself is also formed in the same way that Ultima uh, actually uh, formed. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, 20 minutes, Katie? You should end it. I should end it now? So you could take another five, five to 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so stop me after, tell me about after five so I won't okay. go much. Further. The last thing, I'm going to change gears again. The last thing I'm going to tell you about uh, is Earth's moon, and also Earth's moon, but probably mostly about Earth's moon. Uh, so Earth's moon was studied for ages, I mean, not scientifically, but it was actually one of the gods, the, the, uh, no, the moon, it's actually, in, is in Hebrew it's called Yareach, okay? Which is actually the, the origin of the name Yericho, Jericho as you know it. So Jericho was one of the places where the moon was worshipped. In any case, um, so we have many, several types of moon, of course, uh, they, I know, I'm not c going to focus mostly on the Earth's moon, which is pretty peculiar, okay? It's the mass ratio to the Earth is one of the over 80, which is much, much bigger than any of the other, uh, other thing. It's also peculiar because I don't know if you ever looked on the other side of the moon. I haven't, but now you can see the other side of the moon. It's actually pretty different, okay? You have different, the two sides actually look pretty different and you can see, easily see it by eye. People discuss their uh, ideas of how to form this. Anyway, this is the moon and people discuss and you have also various orbital uh, all the orbital amendments. I'm not going to go that. I'm going to go a bit faster uh, because of time. 
as you might know, the moon tidally evolves and gets away from us in like two centimeters a year because of tidal evolution. And I won't go into that. We also have direct, and today we can actually measure it using the you know, a laser to the, to the moon and back and actually measure the distances. But in principle, we can also have other elements. So what else? We know a lot about the moon because we've been there. At least so the government claims. And <laughs> so we have some material coming back from the moon. And we can actually analyze this uh, material and see what's the, the composition. And what is found uh, is, just before that, is, is it? Ah, I'll get back, back to it in, in a second, but the composition between the Earth and the Moon, uh, the, the, the composition is, uh, is very similar in terms of various uh, different isotopes. And that was an interesting problem, and I'll explain why in a second. But if you think about how uh, moons form, or terrestrial moons form, what people think is that the last stages of planet formation, terrestrial planet formation, you have these, all these planetary embryos, and now they are actually massive enough to perturb each other dynamically, and sometimes they cross orbit and they collide. When they collide, you can see that kind of the evolution, the evolution of time is mass, and you see you have these several pla different planets, and each time they collide, they can form more massive planets, and the last stages we even have these really huge giant impacts of comparable size uh, uh, planets that, uh, that uh, collide with each other. So people suggest that, that you could actually have, uh, uh, people suggest various different ideas about the origin of the moon. I won't go too much into them, but uh, uh, Darwin, not that Darwin, his son, I think, I don't remember, uh, suggests that you have this fission. Let's say you have this very fast rotating planet. It kind of uh, cuts off in two and, and you form this kind of lump that goes outside. That, that is the moon. You can have a capture. Somehow you dissipate the energy and you're getting, uh, getting capture of the companion, let's say tidally capture or whatever. It's not very easy to do. Maybe they go together through co accretion. And then people suggest you have these giant impacts. You have these two planets colliding together, and then some material is uh, thrown out and forms this debris that where the moon forms. Most of these models have various different issues and problems. I won't go into them. The main issue is that in fact, it actually solves most of the problems and, and, and can explain most of the things beside the composition. What you see when you look on the uh, impact of uh, two things is that most of the material that gets into the debris that forms the moon, it comes from the impactor, not from the planet itself. So if the two of them were different, they should be different, and the Earth and the moon should be different too. And uh, let's see if I can stop. Um, oh, it's only here that I see it. Okay. It's a pity. I have a nice movie, but let's go on because I don't have the time. Anyone, anyone wants to see it later on? Feel free to do it. Ah, oh, it is. Okay. So this was a giant impact, okay, that formed this, all of this debris. There's a lot of this uh, big particle stuff. We can actually, this would be an SPH, then we can actually follow it in n body simulation to follow the evolution of this for a longer time. And what you see in general is all this debris slowly, but uh, quite faithfully, continue and accretes each other until this big thing here accretes all of the other stuff, or almost all of it, and actually gets into much more circular orbits. So in principle, this should work, and you can actually form a moon through this uh, giant impact. Okay. Um, so I told you that we have a problem with the composition, because the composition doesn't work out. And so there's a huge problem, and the huge problem is that it's not made of cheese, basically, which is, it's not made of things that coming from the Earth. Uh, so how can you actually solve it? As it turns out, you can actually uh, solve it in a very simple way. And the idea is that uh, instead of saying, usually we think about these different objects having different composition. We actually even see it. If you look on Mars, for example, or meteorites, you see a very big difference. You have like between 300, uh, about 300 particles per million uh, compared with the difference between the Earth and the Moon, which is the order of 10, okay? So they are very different. So that's all consistent. And so the, uh, the Moon should also be very different. Well, is that the case? So people have various suggestions on how to solve it. They have problems, uh, mostly with the angular momentum, the spin that you get. I won't go into it because of time, sorry. So what can be the solution? What we suggest is the following. Maybe it's not correct that those things that impact the Earth actually have very different uh, composition. If you think about it, those planets that survive, by definition, never collided with the Earth. And we see they have different composition. And that's consistent also with models that people did. But let's look on all the things that went into the Earth, all the, the things that collided into the Earth, okay? What was the composition just before the collision? 
the material that they would contribute to a giant impact. Once you look at this, it turns out you actually find in many of the cases, what you see here is uh, uh, no, the origin of material that came in the end into the Earth and then into the, in the, to the Moon. And what you see here is that you can actually have many cases where the composition you can see by eye is very different. This is the amount of material that comes from the Earth to this debris. Because people find simulation, it goes from zero to up to 40%. But even see, here you can see that it's pretty different composition between the blue, the Earth, and the, and the Moon. But we also find many cases, when you do this Monte Carlo a calculation or different models, that in like 10 to 20% of the cases, you can get a, a composition very similar to the Earth. How is that? There is the, the very simple uh, uh, answer. This portable this, this embryos actually collide with the Earth by definition kind of came close to theirs, and most of them actually grew in a very similar environment to theirs, much more similar than any other uh, planets that we see. And so actually they collected the material from much more similar thing, uh, similar region. So this is why when they collide, they actually could always, to begin with, they were, had much more similar solution. So it's kind of very simple, but potentially works out. So it's, so you don't need to be too very, no, you need to be a bit lucky, but not too much, like one in five, one in 10, in order to actually get this uh, composition. I've talked about the final thing, and uh, with that I'll end. I'm suggesting that even this scenario is actually not complete, uh, this basic giant impact. I told you about that. Any time formation paradigm today, or the coefficient suggests that you have many giant impacts. But if you have many giant impacts, you should have many moons. Each giant impact will actually produce a moon. So what happens if you have more than one moon? What happens if you have an impact, you form a Davidis, you form a moon. This moon now start tidally evolve, become further and further out from the Earth. Now we have another giant impact. It forms another moon, and then that other moon also tidally evolves. Tides are strongly depending on the distance from the star, or from, or from the planet, planet in this case. The closer you are, the faster the tidal evolution. So the inner moon kind of migrates much faster than the outer moons. So it kind of tries to run it up. And actually, if it goes close enough, they start to strongly interact gravitationally, and then you have oh no, all hell great get loose. So you basically have a chaotic evolution. What can it, can it do? This is the same kind of idea that we see here. You have the, the, you know, the first moon start going and then slows down. The second moon comes after 10 mega years, and you can see it comes very fast to actually cross orbit with that one. So what happens when you have this uh, inter interaction? You have all this possibility. Okay, so you started with two, these two moons they can either merge together to form a larger moon. They can both fall into the Earth. One of them can fall, uh, they can both form a moon that then falls to the Earth, or one of them can be fa fall to the Earth and the other one can be ejected or actually survive. Okay? So you have all of these uh, different uh, possibilities, the chaotic evolution. You can do many end-body simulation to see what kind of things happens. And it turns out most of the cases, okay, depends on various parameters, but most of the cases, either they merge or the second, the second, the, the moon, the outer moon actually survives. So it can actually then, another moon can come by and can also accrete onto that. So in general, what we expect that in any planet formation system, terrestrial planet formation, every planet, terrestrial planet should have many moons. Whether they should have a moon in the end depends really on this complex evolution. Maybe it doesn't have any moons because they actually you know, died into the planet, they collided with the planet, maybe Venus. Maybe they formed an Earth-like moon which could either be formed through several moons or could be just the final last giant impact that formed the moon. But both of them can happen. By the way, if it formed like several moons that collide with each other, it actually might have a different composition from one side to the other side. It might also have a different structure from one side of the moon to the other side. Maybe that's one of the results of, uh, that can explain the structure. Interesting that Chinese are, uh, are sending a mission to take material from the other side of the moon, which we haven't took until now. If they found it's very different, that would be a very interesting thing. If they don't, it does, still doesn't mean that this didn't happen, but it's, uh, uh, at least you have one direction which it could be a smoking gun signature. The other way, I don't know. But certainly, if you think about regular core accretion mechanism, this must have happened. You have many giant peaks, but you have to have many, many moons. So Earth's moon is actually not the first, probably the last, but not the first one, and you have uh, many of them. By the way, when moons fall into the Earth, they might even form some continents, but that's uh, just a small issue. So, I'll finish with that. We'll discuss exomoons, and I'll thank you again for your uh, patience with me. So, 
I look on I look on the exhibition of people seeing you know meteorites and whatever and these things even and even the exhibition of things that came from the moon from the same side but from different places. When I look on the statistics and it's relatively small statistic, you can actually see that they have no they kind of do an average thing about the differences and then they get something which is small. But you can actually see some cases where it was actually pretty high. So the average, if you take all the putting together. It's many times you know it's science. So you actually need to look on the details. So I would be careful about saying the distribution in between different samples is actually much higher than uh, what people say. So it's statistics, or who knows? Uh, I mean, given the small samples. Uh, but uh, so yes. But anyway, for the other moon, for the other side of the moon, I'm not sure. That, what I say is that if they have the good evidence of very different, then it's a very strong evidence for that. If they don't. Even the mixing, even if you have giant two moons, they can actually mix a lot, and it's very difficult to say whether they actually have a different composition. So I certainly agree that this is not a strong prediction in that sense, but strong only for one side, but not the other one. Uh, but what I'm saying is, whatever you, whatever you say, this should have happened anyway if you believe the current paradigm of giant formation of the, and, and multiple giant impact. So this should have happened. Whether the Earth's moon is a merger product or just a giant impact, I cannot really say by, by itself uh, right now. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll ask about, well, so I'm wondering if, if your final stage here of having lots of giant impacts is kind of a problem for your initial stage of panspermia and you only need a few seeds. Obviously, the whole idea of the planetesimal hypothesis and the hero giant impacts that increases the number of seeds you need, and I'd say probably a bigger problem might be how, how do you propose to get the Kuiper belt? There you need at least to capture 10 to the eight uh, or so, right, super 10 kilometer bodies where the gas density is lower, that didn't seem to be on the charts for your models. Okay, so what we find is that certainly it would be difficult to capture big things, okay? We can capture small things, and actually many of them, because you have larger impact parameter, you have larger surface area, so you can, small things you can capture easily and tons of them. Big things, kilometer size, Probably not. So in that sense, I agree that for the Kuiper belt, uh, if you want, you know, to just seed the Kuiper belt with, I don't know, whatever, uh, you can still get uh, a lot, but no, but less, smaller numbers. Uh, but again, this depends when did you actually form. If it was the very, very early stages things that I told you about, then kind of after the only the first one that you didn't have a lot of planetesimal in IS and planetesimal, no way. Today, with much, the much, much larger number, depends because. In this model, but this is also true for many of the streaming instability models or any kind of things going about kilometer size, right? How do you get 100 meter size planetesimals? We see them. We have near Earth objects, we have tons of them. How do you form them if you form them big and then, then you can actually do fragmentation and you call, call this, yes. right? So, of course, you can do that. So, the same ideas can actually also always get you. You, get, you don't try to make the Kuiper belt object from, from capturing stuff. You make bigger things that fragment later on. So you start just seeding them, they grow and fragment in the same way. So the question is, it's the same question, do we have, do we have a kilometer size object in the Kuiper belt, okay? Uh, or, a, uh, sorry, if you do have a hundred meter size object, in, you know, we don't know right now. Hopefully we know with occultation, but right now I don't think we know. I think the smallest one is like kilometer that we, people found. Uh, so if you don't find, for example, so if you find them, it could be fragmentation, it could be other thing. So the issue is true for any, any model that suggests you have to jump over, you still need to refill the smaller ones. The question, of course, now is the scale. Can it actually get larger and then refill the kilometer size and 100 meter size and, or 100, 10 kilometer size or not, or is it enough? So I'm not true. Maybe it doesn't work with the Kuiper, but that is true. Okay, what I'm saying is that not seeing the small thing is a problem for anyone in some sense. Oh, seeing a small thing could be a potential problem for anyone. Uh, 
Okay, so, so as a good question, basically it, it goes back into what is the chemical composition gradient or whatever, and it is. It's a gradient, it could be a ring, could be whatever. And that, of course, whatever you draw in sense of what goes in composition depends on what you assume to begin with about the gradient of the composition. So we tried several models, other groups also tried several models. So we, it does depend on that. And I agree, completely agree that this is not very well constrained right now. So this was on based on kind of basic theoretical models, what people see in meteorites, try to, what we looked on is assume that we have, let's say linear gradient between the Earth's position and the Mars position, for example. And then you say, let's assume that you have a linear composition which changes between that and that and continue it, okay? This is one, one assumption. You can do it not nonlinear. You can do it that you have maybe rings. So people try to do things. In most of our cases, uh, in, in our case, we do the linear or in a bit more uh, uh, tilted uh, cases, we actually still got it with this position is that. Uh, but I completely agree that if the composition, it was not like just a simple linear gradient between Earth and, and the Mars, for example, but something much more complicated, certainly it could be, then really it depends on what you, you get. But what we do find is that Yes, if you come from close environment and assuming that there, there's no huge differences between close positions, it's like uh, more continuous, it's very likely that it could work out with that. By the way, the multiple impacts can also have, if it's merger of multiple, multiple moons, statistically you're coming into the, this average, so it's kind of a co-accretion. Both the Earth and the moon grow at the same time by several impacts. So that also helps getting them back into kind of the same average in that sense. So that's also helpful in the sense of the multiple impacts. I don't know, I thought there should be a huge difference between things nearby if they came from completely different solar systems. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 right, uh, yeah, sorry, one, one, one final. Um, going back to the binary, uh, K KBO, as you mentioned, we start off wide um, and to get optical level uh, secondary evolution. It's not optical level, it's quasi secular, it's not optical. It's okay. So, 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 okay, so what do you mean by wide? Lower than the evolution? So, Typically about 0.1 of the hill radius. So 0.1 to po above 0.1, you get to this, into this regime. We actually see kind of those of binary at this about 0.1, uh, uh, 0.1 uh, hill radius already. And they are pretty, by the way, highly inclined eccentric, which is also interesting. But, uh, but certainly we do see them, and this, but this is the more or less the scales that you need in order for this to work. By the way, in some of the ideas of formation of binaries, not, not a collapse, Okay, but the, some of the ideas that you actually capture, at least for the massive binaries, they are actually captured at about heat radius and then slowly in spiral. So in those cases, all of them would actually go through this regime, not necessarily in terms of inclination, but at least in terms of separation, they would go through this regime in any case, in this scenario of a Kuiper belt uh, binary formation. So that's another interesting aspect, uh, aspect of that. Um, all right, well, if you'd like to ask anything else of Hagai, he's, he's up here, let's thank him again. Thank you.